Let's remember Jesus and proclaim him as we take the Lord's Supper together. To help prepare our hearts, I want to spend the next few minutes considering 1 Peter 2, verse 24. So if you don't have a Bible of your own, we want to give you one so that you can read God's word for yourself. So if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and some men on either side will give you, uh, give you one. If you don't own a Bible, this is yours to keep. So please open your Bibles to 1 Peter 2, verse 24. And let's read together. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Let's just walk through this verse phrase by phrase. He himself, he is Jesus. He is God the Son, the eternal second person of the Trinity, through whom, by whom, all things were made. He is the Lord. And he himself, here it's explicitly referring to the sinless suffering servant prophesied in Isaiah 53, 4. Isaiah 53 is in view throughout this paragraph in 1 Peter. A few verses prior in 1 Peter 2, 22, Isaiah 53, 9 is quoted speaking of the sinless suffering one. Jesus committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. He is the least deserving being in the universe and beyond to suffer. And yet he suffered more intensely than any other ever will or or we could even comprehend, much less endure. He himself bore our sins. He bore our sins As a substitute, none of these sins that he bore were his own. He bore our sins. Christian, he bore your sins. He bore mine. And not just sins generally, but specifically. Each sin and its penalty he bore completely, finally, once for all. And he bore sins, not for a group in general, but it was our sins in particular and their unfathomable, unbearable penalty. And each one of us whose sins were born can rightly say with Paul, Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. And he suffered for those sins. 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ suffered once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bear us, that he might bring us to God. Jesus' suffering as he bore our sins was real. It was miserable. It was the will of Yahweh to crush him to put him to grief. Isaiah 53 says his soul was in anguish as he bore those sins. This suffering should have been mine. Christian, it should have been yours. Each of us should bear the just penalty for our sins, but in love, God the Father Jesus' father and yours and mine, Christian, he punished Christ as if he had committed every sin of all those who would believe. And the suffering that you and I deserve for transgressing an infinite God, it can't even be comprehended by our finite mind, nor absorbed by our finite body, even given infinite time. Jesus is the only one who could do this. Jesus is the only one who would do this as God, bearing our sins as substitute. What love, what grace. 
Christian, Jesus bore our sins. He suffered once, one time, and that was sufficient for all of us for all time. He does not still suffer. In the Lord's Supper, we remember, but he is not sacrificed again. He does not suffer again. After he suffered, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for all time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. He suffered once for sins. But oh, how he suffered. The statement, he himself bore our sins in 1 Peter 2, we said, had Isaiah 53 in mind. It says, surely he himself bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was smitten by God. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was chastened for our well-being. He was scourged for our healing. The slaughtered lamb, the Lord put him to grief as a guilt offering. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, God's justice is satisfied. He bore our sins to justify the many. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. Without a body, he could not be crushed. He could not suffer God's just wrath in the place of sinners whom God was saving. So Jesus in glorious humility took on a body. And in that body, he was crucified on the cross And as he did that, he bore our sins in the body, in his body. In a couple minutes, we're going to distribute pieces of bread and cups of juice, physical reminders of Jesus' body, of his blood. And he suffered in his body the just penalty for those sins, all of it. None remains for those who are forgiven. He suffered once for all for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. If any sin remained, we could not be with God. If any sin remained, we would still have punishment to bear. If any sin remained, we could not be in a holy God's presence. But God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He didn't just bear some of our sins. He bore them all in his body once for all on the cross. There is now no, more, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The record of debt and all of its legal demands that stood against us have been set aside, nailed to the cross, borne by Jesus in his body for all those who have been given faith in him. But you need to listen to this. Not all have Jesus as their substitute. Not all the sins of all in the world have been borne away, but only those who turn to Jesus in repentance and faith. Leon Morris's words are helpful here. Consider carefully if this is you. To put it bluntly and plainly, If Christ is not my substitute, I still occupy the place of a condemned sinner. If my sins and my guilt are not transferred to him, if he did not take them upon himself, then surely they remain with me. If he did not deal with sins, I must face their consequences. If my penalty was not borne by him, it still hangs over me. If you don't have faith, if you're not a Christian, please let the bread and juice pass when it comes. But don't leave here in that condition. Don't leave here without talking to me, praying with me, one of the pastors. We'll have people over here on the left after the service. We're going to have a meal together afterwards, and there will be hundreds of people who would love to help you know this Jesus.
as your Lord and Savior so that you might turn to him in repentance and faith and your sins would no longer hang on you, but they would be placed each and every one on him, on his body, born away completely at the cross. But if you don't repent, if you don't turn to him in faith, your sin is still on you. Finally, back to 1 Peter 2, 24. There's a purpose. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. We're going to be hearing all about this in the waters of baptism. Jesus didn't only die to remove the penalty of sin. He died so that our old self, our fully sinful self, would also die with him and be raised to new life, a new life characterized by righteousness. At salvation, we are indeed declared righteous and Jesus' righteousness imputed to us. But also at salvation, you and I, if you were saved, died to sin and you were made alive together with Christ so that you would live to righteousness. This death and new life is the picture that we see in baptism that we're going to be seeing throughout this service. But we also see reminders of this death to sin and new life at communion. Don't forget that. And Christian, don't merely remember the cross as something that happened 2,000 years ago. Consider your life and the way that you're, that you're responding to trials, the way that you endure suffering, what you're doing with blessing. Consider where you may be living inconsistently with this life of righteousness secured for you by Jesus' death on the cross. And don't miss this opportunity to confess sins where you see them. And turn from them. Jesus died in order that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus' suffering, his blood poured out and body broken, is our only hope from healing from this deathly disease of sin that puts us at enmity with God. Living to sin is a miserable existence with an even more miserable end. And there's only one cure. There's only one way. We cannot make up for our own sins through our own suffering, through penance, through our own atonement. Our religious efforts do not contribute to our salvation. There is no way to be at peace with God or free from the, this curse of sin other than than Jesus in his wounds, his body broken, pierced, and crushed. Unless Jesus suffered, unless his blood flowed, there could be no peace. There would be no peace, no healing. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. By his wounds, we are healed. Men, please serve us. Take communion on your own as your hearts are prepared, then I'll come up and we'll pray together.